Today's guest on the podcast is a really, really interesting lady who hails from uh, Cincinnati. She's actually, as a completely aside, she is the secretary of the Cincinnati Curling Club, but that is not why we're interviewing her today, although that is interesting in its own way. Um, she is the founder of an organization called Illumination Partners. She's the host of her own podcast, The Drop-In CEO, and she's the author of the book, The CEO's Compass. And we spend quite a bit of time talking about The CEO's Compass because the work that she does is really helping CEOs you know, drive businesses, grow businesses and, and, and really achieve their vision and their mission and to follow their North Star in terms of the work that we're doing. So she does, talk, we do talk a lot in the, in the interview about, you know, what causes CEOs to kind of suddenly find themselves off track. And the CEO's compass is about how you can get yourself back on track and the things that you need to do. So we talk a lot about people, how you engage people, how you develop people, how you grow people, how you grow your team, and really also how you, 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 you develop them through coaching those people and growing the people and helping them to become the best that they can be. So we also talk about feedback, giving and receiving feedback, which is a big topic for Deb. So really encourage you to listen to this, some great tips. And the CEO's compass is excellent. And she talks a lot about the things that you can really keep on that compass to make sure that you are following your North Star and that you're getting to the destination that you want to get to. Love you to give us some uh, really good kudos on the feedback to really give us that, because if we get that, then we can actually reach more people. So the more testimonies we get on the likes of Spotify and iTunes, we can reach more people. And that at the end of the day is the objective. But in the meantime, sit back and enjoy the very interesting and the very experienced and a very, very uh, high powered coach, uh, Deb Covello. Deb, thank you so much indeed for joining us here on the podcast. It's a great honor to have you. John, it is my pleasure. And I am so excited to have this conversation and hopefully provide some value to your listeners. Oh, I've no doubt that you will do that. I know that you're the founder of the of Illumination Partners. I know that you're the host of your podcast, The Drop-In CEO. And I know that you're the author of The CEO's Compass. Uh, so and I want to come back and talk about the book. But maybe if you can just make, give a bit of background to people so people can understand the context where you're coming from and your, your history. All right. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. And, you know, I choose to start with the personal because I think that's what people want to know, that there's a real human here, not just a talking head. I am married to my best friend of 33 years. I have three lovely children that are out on their own, making uh, really impact on society. And uh, a fun fact, I am a curler. So I, I do know. throw 42 pounds of rock on ice. I sweep hard and yell at people and don't get in trouble. <laughs> so and, that's and by the way, I also know that you're secretary of the Cincinnati Curling Club. Uh, yeah, you know, it is, it's, it's a worthy organization. We all come together in sport and sportsmanship. And if I, by being on the board, can help evolve that community and have people enjoy the sport, that is the work that I should be doing. So thank you for acknowledging that. You know, that's the personal side. I love community. I love cooking. I love walking. But really, uh, a little bit on the technical side of who I am, I am an engineer by training. I have always been in various roles in operations and manufacturing. I love taking nothing and turning it into something. And so my journey has taken me from aerospace into electronics, a startup company, that was a roller coaster, to eventually winding up in the flame flavors and fragrance industry with some of the most wonderful multinational organizations where I eventually moved from roles in quality and continuous improvement to the glorious roles of the vice president of operational excellence and ultimately of quality, making sure we protect people and the brands that they love. So that's the technical side of me. Love the work that I've, I've done, but I also now love the work I do in my own company, as you said, a 
illumination partner, servicing medium-sized companies and business owners through business transformation. But a key part of it is elevating the people and their capability and their confidence. So that's me real quick. And your, and your background <laughs> certainly serves you well. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's the very significant roles that you had in, in, in tough industries and in demanding industries and certainly the the subject matter that you were covering are, you know is 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 quite detailed but let me go back to the the book i mentioned the ceo's compass um you refer to it as if i'm correct as the guide to get back on track for the ceo in your experience deb what do you find are the things that actually cause the ceos to get off track that's a wonderful question. And thank you for that, because it's one of those things that we are amazingly talented and you also as well have had some very high level positions. It's because we are so talented. We follow that recipe over and over again, and then conditions or the environment changes and what worked in the past is no longer serving you. So leaders will go to a place of lacking confidence, or I feel off track, but I don't know what to do. Sometimes we hire consultants. We follow a five-step approach. We put in new systems. We blow up what we have thinking that's the solution. And what I have learned from my experience when I didn't have a playbook on what did I need to get back on track, and I have seen it in the leaders that they serve, that there are a couple things that are missing. One, they are always seeking results when in per actuality they're a pursuit of peace of mind. A leader that focuses on results will get a result and everybody will high five and say, victory, we are getting the sales and the profitability that we want. And then the next month, when we don't get that results, we have emails, we have meetings, we beat the people until we can get the result. We stress the organization only to high five again, and you go through this cycle. What if a leader, and this is my insight, the biggest thing is that ultimately we're looking for going to true north or peace of mind. What would it look if we drove our people to an outcome that may take a little while and not every month you get that result, but if we elevate the people, align the people on purpose and give them the capability to align their role to that greater purpose, you start getting the entire workforce to go towards true north or peace of mind. I needed to write the book because that is a very uh, big distinction I found in leaders that are very successful. And you look at them and you look at them looking at their teams and you can see and feel peace of mind, knowing that the people are taking care of the business and taking care of your customers. A results -orient oriented leader is going to go through the cycle of chaos. That's the main insight around the compass. And mm -hmm. then around the compass are seven compass points on those areas that I find that if you pull on one or two of those and start developing those, they get you back to true north. I want to come back to the, the seven points on, on, on the compass, yes. but just to just to kind of um, hone in on what you were saying there, and and it's curious. I was just you know I would be a fan of Seth Godin's material and the books that he that he has written, and one of the things that Seth Godin talks about quite a lot um, is is not getting so focused on the result or the outcome, but making sure that you actually got the right process. Right to actually to get there. So if you've got the right process and you're doing the right things, then you know then you will actually get the get the result. Would you subscribe to that view? I'm a fan of standard work. I am a lean practitioner. Well, yeah, absolutely. If you, yeah. <laughs> if you want to have a sustainable. Uh, and growth model for your business. Yes, you do need to have the right processes in place and standardized. So as the company grows, you can have the confidence that the next person that fills a role will repeatedly deliver the same service or process. So I am a big fan of that. However, there's a caveat with that. If you say, I got all the right people on the bus, I've got all the right processes and think they're going to get to true north, potentially that could be a pitfall because mm -hmm. when I think about processes, you can have good processes, but there is a human dimension. What if you have the great people, but they hit a roadblock because they don't have the right mindset or they don't know how yeah. to navigate complex situations with the people in front of them and how to manage difficult conversations? If we don't have leaders that are willing to take the time to mentor the individual on their mindset and their behaviors and strengths and taking the time to view and coach the uh, individuals, even if you got a great meeting structure, you got great processes, humans 
<laughs> companies are still run by humans. And unless we understand that interaction of humans with your process and you never validate if it's working or as conditions change, you need, maybe need to coach new behavior as they interact with these processes. So process is part of it, but the human dimension, the interaction with that is an add-on. I, yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that because I think that you can't rely on process alone because process is, is, is just what it is. It's a process. It's yes. actually the combination of the people and the process. Um, and, and also recognizing where you need to change and when you need to change, because not what necessarily worked last year is not necessarily going to work this year. Um, yeah. So it's being able to, to adopt that. To go back to the CEO, one of the things that I, you just kind of touched on it, but just want to come back to it is my experience. Sometimes people, not, not just in CEOs, but as senior, as senior, as senior leaders, generally speaking, is that the, an aha moment for many of them is when they realize that what got them there is not going to get them to the next stage and, and not to rely on what it was that got them to that position. And I think that that can be quite a significant aha moment. Is that something that you've experienced? Oh yes, over and over again. <laughs> it's I, I've been stubborn at times. Like, hey, if I work harder and I keep pushing and grinding and working weekends, etc., I'm going to get the results. And yes, you may, but at sacrificing your own mm -hmm. as well as the people around you. So. I have calmed down a little bit that activity doesn't necessarily yield results. But there's another thing that I subscribe that I'd like to add on to that is I call it corporate courage because sometimes leaders, one, have to stop and reflect, do I need to continue to do this or change what I do? And there's also the courage of sometimes I might need to ask for external help on top of the talents that I have. So I think it is really good for leaders to pause and reflect. If they don't feel good, if their gut or their energy feels off, take a mini sabbatical, reflect on where am I at? How do I feel? And what do I need to do going forward? And do I need some help? A lot Absolutely. of leaders don't do that and they pull the trigger too late. Absolutely. Can I go back to the compass that you referred to? Yes, and and the, there's a seven point assessment that you say that finds the problems. Can you maybe just kind of talk us through that? Thank you for that. So there are several compass points. I'll go through them very uh, quickly. Uh, around the so Southern Hemisphere are people, process, and platform or tools. But the thing that is different is not just hiring the right people, putting the right process in place and having the right technology. It's the mentoring of the people. Are you giving them the right feedback? Do you have the right processes? Do people understand how to field the people in front of them and how to interact? And as people move through, do they have the right tools to make good decisions and manage their work, platforms, roadmaps, et cetera? That's all of that. So it it's more of a human thing, people, process, and tools. Of course, I do talk about a leader must have a purpose, but they need to cascade it throughout the organization because when we try to achieve the ultimate outcome, maybe certain people in the organization have the ability to connect with the purpose. But if you haven't evaluated everybody's ability and talents to be able to do that work, real case in point, we want to be the number one with our customer. And your customer service and salespeople will absolutely know what to do. But what about a person in your operations and they don't necessarily touch the customer? Customer, but they touch internal customers. Do they have the talent to know what it me means to be number one with their internal customers? And that's the gap leaders don't look at to understand, do they have everything they need to be successful? So very key, the performance compass point, which is very close to true north. Two more compass points that are actually quite unique for me is past and pride. West and East. Past is about culture. Even if you've been working with a group of people for a while, or if you acquire a new organization, we're acquiring a lot in, as part of our business models. Take the time to make sure you understand the people and their culture. So you understand that information as you move forward together as one in pride. Pride is the intersection of humanity and intellectual property, the gifts that people have that they bring to this moment in time. If a leader does not take the time to understand those gifts, even if they don't need it right now, we pay respect to the human knowing we've asked the question. And when we treat people not as a commodity because they're a subject matter expert, but treasure and respect the intellectual property, give it the respect that you would for any software or patent, et cetera, 
when people leave, if you haven't protected that intellectual property, you destabilize the organization. So it's very, very important to look at the pride. So those are the seven compass points that I have found. If you pull on one or two of them and make some course corrections, as I make suggestions in the book, leaders will start feeling peace of mind and at ease that the ship is going in the right direction. So really, and so we're talking about pride, um, yes. and it's not—it's not something that you hear talked about a lot. Do you see that as being the the kind of the major corporate destabilization? Oh, <laughs> you actually brought up a big thing. Um, well, there's a, there's so much around that because if we just think of people as a commodity, they're subject matter experts, they're steady eddies, they do their job, they'll never leave. <laughs> we need to make sure we understand who those people are and do is their intellectual property known and preserved and maybe shared with others because things happen. People leave the business and unless you have redundancy or you've preserved that knowledge, they leave the business, they go away and then, oh my, we are left with a whole or a gap in understanding or technology, and that's where you destabilize. So I think businesses really need to treasure. Can you make that person a trainer, elevate them so they can share their knowledge, document their knowledge. So as the people change, the processes continue. Mm. I mean, we'll all say, and, and I'm just curious from your experience of working, you know, it, it, within the corporate world, but also yeah. now as, as a coach, the corporate world, you know, we'd all say, you know, with the kind of motherhood and apple pie statement, oh, oh, our people are our most critical asset, our most our most important asset. But do we actually live that? <laughs> well, thank you for that question. I have had the good fortune of interviewing a couple really amazing CEOs of companies on my podcast, and they do get it. I wish and I hopefully I will be working with those companies because they truly believe and support and give people the tools they need to do the work and they just guide the ship. I have had one bad experience with a leader that uh, was guiding a major strategy change for us. And I said to them, I said, you need to share this amazing strategy so everybody can be behind it and provide their creativity in order to achieve that strategy. We need to cascade that. And he says, well, yeah, I can. I said, but what I really need is people heads down getting the results each month. I want them to get to the budget. I want them to hold the service numbers. I'll worry about the strategy. And I thought, oh my, this is a missed opportunity. They missed the opportunity to personally connect with the people, explain the strategy, and then ask for their opinion on what they need to do to get to that strategy versus maybe only relying on the first line of leadership under them. I feel sorry for those leaders that are so narrow-minded on the result when they probably don't value the people and their input and, and the value that they could too have an impact on that strategy. Mm -hmm. So I've seen some not so good leaders. They look good on paper, but working with them, they have so many missed opportunities with engaging firsthand with people. And yeah. I, I, I'm curious to, to hear what your view is as to um, because no one will ever say, you know, if you, if you say to somebody, do you believe that you should coach your people? No one's going to say, no, I don't. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. But having said that, not everyone does. And I mean, and research would clearly show that there are you know, many CEOs and many leaders who don't coach. Why do you think they don't coach their people? They will manage their people, but they don't coach them. Wow, you've got me thinking about that one. I don't know that either they think it is not important they need to focus on the result. But if they mm -hmm. focus, on, focus on the account, uh, the outcome of people are your greatest tool in your toolbox and you need people to run the company and they don't recognize the value of succession planning, they are focused on the wrong thing. They may get the promotion or the bonus because of the result, but when people start leaving, they don't respect. They may never have been coached themselves, so they don't understand wow. what good coaching is. Well, so I think that's, that's, a big, yeah. that's a big part of it, actually, Deb, is that I don't think that they... Yeah, I think that they don't, you know, if you really peel it back and once or twice when I've pushed back on it, they don't actually know how to, you know, because they've never, either never experienced it or they don't know the difference between a coaching conversation and a management conversation. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because through hard knocks and figuring it out, I'd been told, don't do that, or you don't say that. And then you're looking for the feedback. Okay, great. Then if I shouldn't have said something that way, where's the coaching? 
you know, what did mm-hmm. I do well? What did, what should I change, et cetera? I talk about that a lot that, you know, feedback is a gift and maybe we've never had that. But if a leader has never been a coach or know how to give feedback, you better figure it out or leverage somebody that can coach them on giving feedback to their people. Because if they don't do it, if they're not coaching their people, they're not coaching the next line. And then people look at these leaders and say, well, I'm not getting feedback. I'm not told how to, or how to handle difficult situations. People, the ones that are high performers will start shriveling back into just being a transaction versus Mm -hmm. being celebrated and opening up their mind to possibilities and ways of performing and coming forth and taking risks. So I feel a little sad for the leader that doesn't provide that coaching. And even if they can't do it, it's that corporate courage. Maybe I need to bring somebody else from the inside because I do value it. And if I don't know how to do it and I don't have the capacity, a smart leader would say, let me bring somebody in to help me and my team. Yeah. I know that you're a big fan of of giving and 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 receiving feedback. Um, but how can we do that better? How can we get be really good at doing that? Well, practice, practice. <laughs> Did I say practice? We need yeah. to practice this. But you know what? I'll make it simple for you. Three simple words. Continue, start, and change. Very simple. We need to take feedback from a place of being scary and negative to something that is positive and actionable. What should I continue? Because it's a strength and it's celebrated. That's how I got to this point. What should I start doing? That if I start doing this in addition to my strength, it will enhance and elevate the impact of what I do. And finally, what should I change? Because it may not hurt me now, but if I continue to do this thing, it will detract from the strength. And when we provide feedback on what are you doing good at, keep going to, you might want to start this. They say, oh yeah, let me try that to change this because it's going to be a distraction. I have an example, but uh, I don't know if that resonates with you, but I have found that is amazing feedback. I've shared that insight with many and it's like, wow, I never thought of it that way. And I know people are actioning on that. Yeah, absolutely. But in order to do that and in order to have that conversation, A prerequisite to actually being able to have that conversation is that that there is that safe environment within the team, within the organization in in order to have that conversation really well. How do you go about really creating that safe environment? Because I mean, the safe environment, it's important for feedback, but it's important for lots of different reasons. How do you go about creating that really safe environment where it's, it's safe to challenge, it's safe to contradict, it's safe to have a contrarian view, it's safe to give the feedback to my boss uh, and it's safe to give a, a feedback to my peers. That's a, that's a new question I've never been asked before, but as I'm reflecting as what you shared with that, one of the things, the two things that I have found that people have said thank you and they felt like they were heard is a leader can't be a firefighter, but they need to be very much an active link uh, listener. Don't be the immediate firefighter, but be a strategic problem solver. When we listen more to the conversations that are in the room or listen more when we're having a one-on-one, the more people feel heard and then you reframe and respond back to them what you heard, then they know you've respected them and they're truly understood. That starts that trust in the relationship mm. because then they may share more. Uh, The other thing, again, when I say listen more and speak less is a leader needs to not jump in and give their subject matter expertise because that's how they've been celebrated in the past. But when they sit back, there's a crisis, there's an issue in the room, they listen to the collective wisdom. And when they reframe and say, this is what I heard, and this is what I think we need to do to move forward, you calm the room. People know that they've been heard and you can move forward. And I think that creates an environment where people feel safer, that they can say whatever they need to say about the situation and know that some piece of wisdom is going to come with it. So listen. I think think it's a a great answer because I think that, you know, for in many organizations, you know, you do hear the, oh, you know, I don't feel I'm listened to. And Mm -hmm. if I don't feel I'm listened to, eventually I'll stop, I'll stop speaking Um, because what's the point? So I think that that really active listening is so powerful that, you know, if a leader can grasp that, I think that that is immensely powerful. Deb, we could go on talking about this because this is a fascinating conversation. And, and, and I know that, you know, the book, The CEO's Compass, I mean, that's, it's a really, 
it's it's a how to it's a manual as well as a as a really good read so i i highly recommend that but before we uh, ask where people can get in touch with you two questions that i ask everybody one is a book other than your own i hate to add um that has impacted you maybe something you're reading now or something you've read in the past Dory Clark is the author. Her first book, Stand Out, because as a thought, as a leader, as a CEO of a company, we're a dime a dozen, unfortunately. But what we all need to do is be thought leaders. We need to figure out how we, our team, our business, differentiate. It's okay to stand out and create a powerful brand, both personal and for the business. And she it is helped fantastic. me immensely. She helped yeah. me immensely. And did I she? interviewed her. <gasps> so excited. Did she? I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. She was wonderful. Amazing person. She is. She's fantastic. I, I love her stuff. I, I, and yes. I think she's got a great brain and, and she's got a great ability uh, to communicate that. Second question, daily rituals, if you have them, uh, if you're happy to share them and what they do for you. I recently changed because I am still in personal development. And while I didn't agree with it, one of my coaches said, your daily ritual should start with a little bit of meditation writing down what's going right afterwards, not just gratitude, and then the affirmations. And I didn't believe in it. But you know what, as I started doing this for the past month, good things are starting to come into my world versus pushing and grinding, affirming and understanding what is going right, because more of that's going to come your way. So I'm a, <laughs> I'm a fan of it now. <laughs> that's fantastic. That, that, yeah. that, that really is great. Deb, where can people get in touch with you? And where can they buy your book? And listen to your podcast. All right. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. The best way is to start at my website, dropinceo.com. That's D R O P I N C E O.com. There is a link to get to my book on Amazon and also visit me on LinkedIn. That is my playground, Deborah A. Coviello, or the Drop In CEO, which is my brand. You'll find me. Let's uh, engage. Let's have a conversation. I would love to talk to you and talk about the compass or how I might be able to support you so again thank you for the opportunity uh, it's been a real pleasure continued success with your curling uh, with the cincinnati club so continued success with that with the, the the ceo's compass and all that you do and it's been a real honor to have you thank you my pleasure